church, as you have opened your Bibles to 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 2, we will be looking at three verses today, verses 14, 15, and 16. We are in our series, Live This Way, which is our study of uh, the Holy Spirit and how He works. And so today we're going to see three things, three things believers live with because of the fact that the Holy Spirit lives within us, that the changes everything for us. But sometimes that is hard to understand in the day-to-day, in how we live our lives. But today we're going to see three things that are very much a part of who we are, what we go through, what we face, because the Holy Spirit lives within us. In fact, in our text today, Paul is going to make a distinction, a very clear distinction, that there is a great divide in the human race. It's just, it's either you're one or you're the other. And he's not talking about an outward difference like in race and gender or nationality or your likes or your dislikes. That's not what he's talking about. This great divide that he's talking about is an inward difference. He puts all humanity in one of two categories. One is the natural man. The other is the spiritual man. Or you could understand it this way, those who have the Spirit and those who do not have the Holy Spirit. And so he he says, really, you can bring everything down to that reality. And if that's true, what does that mean for those who have the Holy Spirit in them? That's really what we're going to be looking at today, in those three things that we're going to see. So let's turn our attention so that we can learn from this and what Paul is saying to the church at Corinth. It is in 1 Corinthians chapter 2 that I will now read verses 14, 15, and 16. And here's what Paul says. He says, The man without the Spirit does not, go ahead and underline that, does not accept, does not accept the things that come from the Spirit of God. Now, all the verses prior to this, we are understanding what the Spirit of God does for us and revealing truth, leading us, guiding us, how we keep in step in in everything that the Spirit does for us that lives within us. We're not orphans any longer, right? He didn't leave us down here to do our own thing. He gave us the Spirit and those things that come from the Spirit of God. So those who don't have the Spirit don't understand that. In fact, how do they view it? Here's what he says. For they are foolishness to him. And he cannot understand them. He said, well, why is that? Here's why. Because they are spiritually discerned. Now, verse 15. The spiritual man makes judgments about all things. But he himself is not subject to any man's judgment. And then 16. For who has known the mind of the Lord that he may instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. How beautiful and powerful that is. So from these three verses, I want us to see the three things believers live with. The first is one that is very clear. It is one that it may be clear, but it is very hard to uh, take it in, to, to live through it, to really Engage it for what it is. And it's simply this, that we live with rejection. Because the Holy Spirit is in us, because we've given our lives to Christ, that we are going to face rejection by those who do not know Christ or those who are not in fellowship with Christ. There is a rejection that comes. And that's why he put it this way, the man without the Spirit does not accept the things that come from the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him, and he cannot understand them because they are spiritually discerned. When I first, I came to know the Lord when I was eight years old, but at 18, there was a full surrender that came in my life. And at that point in time in my life, when I fully surrendered, there were changes taking place for me. And I didn't fully grasp them or understand them. And the first change that came for me, there was an an incredible freedom that came that I felt that I was had fully surrendered my life to the Lord, and there was a freedom where I had confessed all sin and made everything right with Him. And the burden was lifted in so many ways and in so many areas of my life. And 
And it was just this unique, I don't know even know how to fully explain it to you, but it was just this unique, uh, just freedom and joy that came in that surrender. And so after that happened, I began to go out and talk to those who I'd known my whole life, grown up with, played with, played sports with, done life with, all of that. And I began to say, man, I am so overwhelmed with joy. And let me tell you what happened in my life. And, and as I began to share those things, people would listen because they knew me and, and they had kind of an interest. But then all of a sudden things began to gradually change. And, so, and for some scenarios, they, they changed drastically immediately. Because there were some people in my life who couldn't relate. There were some people in my life who couldn't identify. There were some people in my life who didn't want to identify. They didn't want to leave a life of sin for them so they could identify with what I had to say. They didn't want to hear what I had to say. They didn't want to be around it. I'm telling you, as the Bible said, I was pouring out light. I didn't even know it. I was speaking truth, telling truth, sharing truth, talking about the freedom, talking about what Jesus had done for me and my full surrender. And they were like, I don't know. You go listen to John 3. It says, the light came into the world, but the darkness, they rejected the light because they loved the darkness. And there is this thing that goes on between light and dark. A problem in our church today is this, is that we're trying to mix light and darkness and love the gray. But there is no such thing in God's kingdom. It's either the natural man or the spiritual man. It's either the one that has the Spirit of God or the one who does not have the Spirit of God. And you can't mix the two. And when you do, you dilute the light. It really is nothing but darkness. It's a form of darkness. And we're called to be light. We're called to be salt. And we've got to live that way. Well, in all of that testimony I'm telling you about when I was 18, I so identify, I can remember it, think about it. It all just comes flooding back to me, those realities. God, I began to pray. And I said, God, I don't know what's going on here. I know you've done something incredible in my life. And, and there's, some, there's some people I've shared it with, you know. I shared it with my parents. They were, they were so thrilled. They've been praying for me. I, I shared it with a pastor I knew, and he was so excited, and a few other friends like that. But then when there was a whole lot of rejection as well going on, and I didn't get it. I just knew it hurt. I just knew it didn't feel comfortable. And I didn't fully understand it. As I began to pray about it, I said, God, help me understand this. He gave me four verses um, that were going to be very meaningful to me to grasp and understand what was taking place. The one we just read is, is one that he gave me is that the man without the Spirit doesn't accept the things that come from the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him. He cannot understand because they are spiritually discerned. He gave me that verse, and it began to make sense to me. They don't get it. They can't get it. It's spiritually discerned. They don't understand it. That helped me. But there were other verses that God gave me. I'm going to share them with you, if I may. One came out of 1 Peter 4, verses 1 through 5, that says this. Therefore, since Christ suffered in his body, arm yourselves also with the same attitude. Because he who has suffered in his body is done with sin. As a result, he doesn't live the rest of his earthly life for human, evil, human desires, but rather for the will of God. See, that's where I was. I was like, God, I just want to fulfill your will. I don't want to, I don't want to live for myself. For you have spent enough time in the past doing what pagans chose to do, living in debauchery, lust, drunkenness, orgies, carousing, and detestable idolatry. Now, that described uh, the life of sin. I hadn't got involved in all that, but I had plenty of sin in my life. But this is the verse he gave me right here. He said, they think it strange that you do not plunge with them into the same flood of dissipation, and they heap abuse on you. What? But he goes on to say, but they will have to give an account to him who is ready to judge the living and the dead. Did you know that once you accept Christ, the Holy Spirit lives within you? When you take a stand for what is right, you are living by the Holy Spirit. Light is pouring through you, God's truth, that people will literally heap abuse on you for that. You know, I thought that when I, can, this is what I thought, when I surrender, everybody's going to be so happy that I'm not living in sin anymore. And there were some, but there were others that were like, what? And they heaped abuse on me. And so God gave me that verse, and it was helpful for me to understand, begin to understand the spiritual battle that was taking place. There's another verse he gave me out of 2 Timothy chapter 3. And uh, the focus verse of that 
came in verse 12 where it says, in fact, everyone who wants to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. I took that to heart as an 18-year-old, and I said, okay, Lord, I, I, I want to pray about that. I want to talk to you about that. If I really take this stand, you're telling me i got to be okay with being rejected, facing persecution, being made fun of. Not everybody's going to be happy about this. And he goes, yes. Yes, Mark, that's right. Are you okay with that? That's really what God asked me. And, 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 I, and I just made a decision. I remember being in the basement where my room was. I got down on my knees, and I surrendered. And this was after I had surrendered. This was sometime weeks after that. And I said, Lord, I'll take whatever rejection comes my way. But I am going to commit to stand on truth, live by truth. If you'll just take care of me, if you'll lead me and you'll guide me. And it was just this overwhelming peace that came in my heart as a young man that it's going to be okay. I will lead you and I will guide you. You just live for me and stand for me. And God gave me that. And it was so helpful. And all of that was um, tied up in this verse, this text, that an unbeliever cannot understand, cannot accept because it's spiritually discerned. Um, th this is so important to grasp if you're going to grow as a Christian. If not, you're going to be in this turmoil between wanting to go back to your old nature to please your old friends versus new nature and, and pleasing God. And some people live in this turmoil, and you can't. You've got to choose. So either you have the Spirit of God living inside of you, or you don't have the Spirit living inside of you. That's the bottom line that he is saying here. It's one or it's the other. Have you ever been out and you're traveling around and you run into somebody you've never met before and they're a believer and, and, and of course you're a believer and you have instant um, connection? Has that ever happened to you before? And you just, what's the connection? It's based on truth, right? It's based on truth and it's based on the fact they have the Holy Spirit in them and you have it in you. There is not a conflict. There's a connection. And that is a testimony of the fact that, that if someone does not have the Spirit in them, they cannot accept what the Spirit of God is doing in you. And this is why he says, if you don't have the Spirit inside of you, you do not accept the things that come from the Spirit of God. That is a definition of rejection. That's rejection. You say, okay. They're rejecting me, but help me fully grasp and understand that. You may ask the question, well, why? Well, it's because the person that doesn't have the Holy Spirit in them, uh, they think the truth that is coming from the Spirit of God that is in you, what he says is this, it is to them foolishness. Foolishness. You know what that means? It means it does not make any sense to them. They can't understand. It. This Greek word for foolishness means that which is dull, boring, useless, ridiculous. It's to them, it's a, it's, a, it's a waste of time. And I'm going to tell you what it is. They feel nothing. You talk about, they, they feel nothing. You hear what I said? They feel nothing. Because the natural man lives based on senses based on emotions, and they feel nothing from this truth. They live by their senses. Their world is understood by what they see, what they hear, what they taste, what they touch and experience. And I'm not being down on them because that's exactly how we all have operated prior to salvation and the Holy Spirit coming inside of us. They live an earthly existence without a spiritual perspective. That's why as you begin to talk truth, you talk about spiritual things, you talk about heaven, you talk about God, you talk about the work of God. They can't understand that truth. Because he said, bottom line, those things you are talking about that are coming from the Spirit of God that is within you, those things are spiritually discerned. This word discern is a legal term from the first century that refers to the ability of of a wise and experienced judge to sift through mountains of testimony to reach the proper verdict. They are going through it all. They're making 
uh, a discernment on what's before them. Now, that's in a legal sense. That's called legal discernment in the courtroom. But that is the illustration that is used to transfer that over to say, we do the same to make a spiritual discernment about what really matters in life. That's spiritually discerned. Now, this sort of discernment is the ability to properly translate the message of the gospel and the truth of God's Word. Now, you say, well, I'm good at that. I can do that. No, you can't. I can't do it, and you can't do it either. Your ability to discern comes from the Holy Spirit that lives within us. The Holy Spirit, in essence, is the translator. He is the one that makes this clear. He is the one that helps us grasp these truths. As I said last week, He turns on the lights, right? So we get it. They, the lost person, doesn't have the translator. They, they, they can't cut the lights on to grasp it. It seems like foolishness to them. It means nothing to them. They feel nothing. Uh, they have no value in understanding what you are saying. John 14, 15 through 17 says, If you love me, you'll obey my commands, and I will ask the Father. He'll give you another counselor to be with you forever, the Spirit of truth. The world cannot accept him because it neither sees him, that's a sense, or knows him. But you know him, for he lives with you and will be in you. See? My son, Josh, is a computer software engineer. And he knows a lot of things I don't know. He speaks a language I can't understand. And uh, he works from home and uh, there's been some times I've overheard some of his conversations in his office, and he's working on the computer, and they're talking this, and they're talking that, and they're, they're going through all this stuff, and I'm like, oh, I don't really know what they're talking about. It's a language I can't understand. Ones and zeros and code. And you, look, you ever seen how they write that code? You see it on the thing, and it, it just looks like a bunch of gibberish to me. It doesn't make any sense at all. Josh is, comes out for a break, and I said, son, what does that mean? Well, Dad... Let me try to tell you what that means. And he begins to translate to me what all the ones and zeros and the code of this and that and what it can do and the string of this and the string of that and how it all comes together to do all this. Now, he's translating to me, and I'm trying to understand. There are times I just go, okay, that sounds great, son. I don't get it, you know. <laughs> I don't know what you're talking about. But he's acting as the translator to explain a language. Now, if I took the time to try to really understand that, if he's that translator, he can help me understand that. See, that's what the Holy Spirit does. The Holy Spirit helps us understand. But if you don't have a translator, you don't have in, uh, the Holy Spirit within you, the, the, all the, the, the terminology, the truth, how God works, redemption, salvation, the fact that we're sinners and how the Bible works together, you, you, you don't get it. You don't get it. This is why we had this great divide in our nation over what is truth. Well, what is our nation based on? Why are we making the decisions we're making in the high courts and the local courts and the decision making in our communities? Why are we on so many different pages? Really, it's two pages. It's truth and non-truth. It's what the Spirit reveals and what others can't understand that we're over here saying this is what God says. This is what honors God. And they don't get it. It's all foolishness to them. We've got to understand that. We've got to take that to heart. Ah, The lost people cannot grasp this. They do not have the Holy Spirit. This is why when I was 18, I felt rejection. And it was real. I had friends that wouldn't call me anymore. I tried to connect with them, and all of a sudden they were busy. I tried to invite them to go to Bible study with me. <laughs> that was a joke. I, I, I'd see them at times. I was so excited. I mean, I think I've told you this before. We walked into the mall one time. I had a friend. We drove up. He said, you going to take your Bible in? I was just so in love with God and the Word of God. I was carrying my Bible everywhere I went. That was an embarrassment to him. I said, absolutely, I'm going to. What are you going to do about it? That's how, that's how raw and immature I was. I was going to get in a fight with him about carrying my Bible into the mall, you know? But that's just, you know, it, it was just, and then it was just that divide. And then it was, we're not going to the mall together anymore, hanging out, you know? 
And, and those things, that it's a divide. It's a rejection. And, 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 and as a human being, we go, oh, man, that hurts. Yeah, it does. I said, man, what, what did I do wrong? What's wrong with me? You want to know what's wrong with me? Jesus Christ. That's what's wrong. He said they will reject Christ in you. That's what becomes the stumbling block. Not me, it's Christ in me. And I have to make sure I don't become the stumbling block, but the Christ in me is a divide. And didn't he say in the Scripture that he would even divide families, mothers and fathers and children and families over the truth, and that we are to choose Jesus Christ? <laughs> yes. I, I just want to say to you, <laughs> when you... When you identify that the Holy Spirit lives within you, you live with rejection. It's part of it. But secondly, he's going to tell them, but you also live with discernment. Verse 15. He said, the spiritual man makes judgments about all things, but he himself is not subject to any man's judgment. See that? That, that word there, judgment, that you see there in verse 15, it is the same word that is used for discernment in verse 14. It's just the verb form, and it's translated judgments. The idea here is to make intelligent, spiritual decisions. And there's three things I want you to grasp about this. Number one, that the spiritual man, now get this, because this oftentimes becomes confusing for people, but I want us to grasp this. The spiritual man, the one where the Holy Spirit's in control, right? The one where the Holy Spirit is revealing truth to us. The spiritual man does not judge others. You said, he said, he makes judgments. Hang on. Listen, he does not judge others. And Jesus taught this clearly, right? In Matthew 7. You can look at it with me. I'm going to read this. Matthew 7, because it's the famous verse we all turn to for uninvolvement. We go, ah, you don't judge other people. Well, hang on. That's true. We don't. Look at what it says in verse 1 of Matthew 7. He says, do not judge or you too will be judged. For in the same way you judge others, you will be judged. And with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. Now, You've got to understand that judgment there is in the state of the fact that you've not checked your own heart, your own motive, and why you're doing what you're doing, saying what you're saying, taking the actions that you're at taking. That's why I said, why do you look at the speck of sawdust in your own brother's eye and pay no attention to the plank in your own eye? I mean, you've never checked yourself. How can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your own eye when all the time the plank is in your own eye? You hypocrite. This is a state of hypocrisy. First take the plank out of your own eye. Then you will see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. I got it. I get it. That's right. In hypocrisy, when I speak into your life and point something out that may be wrong, and I've not checked my own life, that's hypocrisy. Because I'm not living the truth. And if I'm not living the truth, I don't have a right to speak truth into your life. That's called judging. Hypocritical judging is what that is. So that is... The spiritual man doesn't do that. The spiritual man is in step with the Holy Spirit. The spiritual man is being led by the Spirit. The spiritual man knows how to speak truth correctly. He knows how to make judgments. That is intelligent spiritual decisions. This is not off the fly out of hypocrisy. You're not even checked yourself and you're speaking into everybody's life here. That's not what we're talking about here. So the spiritual man does not judge others, as it notes in Matthew 7. But what does he do? He does, he does make discernments concerning life. Meaning that he views the world through God's truth. I want you to turn to 1 Corinthians 5. This is a clear example that is often quoted and used in connection to making uh, discernments concerning life among believers in the church. You only have to go a few more chapters over to verse chapter 5, to look at verses 9 through 13 to see where Paul makes this illustration clear. He said, I have written you in my letters not to associate with sexually immoral people. Now, he's talking about sexually immoral people within the church who are, listen, clearly here, non-repentant. Did you hear me? I'm going to make that distinction here. That's what he's talking about, a non-repentant person who claims to be a believer. And then he goes on in verse 10, he says, not all uh, not at all meaning the people of this world who are immoral and, or, or the greedy and the swindlers or the idolaters. 
In that case, we would have to leave the world. What he's saying is the world's going to act like the world. They're lost. They don't have the Spirit of God in them. In fact, we were that way before we were saved. We had sin in our life, right? So he said, I'm not talking about the world. I'm talking about in the church, among those. In fact, the example here is of one who is involved in sexual immorality, who is unrepentant in their heart. But he goes in verse 7, he said, But now I am writing you that you must not associate with anyone who calls himself a brother, but is sexually immoral or greedy, an idolater or a slanderer a drunkard, or a swindler. There's a whole list there. With such a man, do not even eat. Wow, that sounds harsh, doesn't it? But you've got to remember, he's talking about someone who is claiming Christ, has forgiven their sins, but they're not living that way. They're living back like the world. And so we're not to associate. It is to make a good discernment concerning that. Now, we live in a day and time where people say, well, you shouldn't shun people. But our, if we live in such a way to approve of their sin, we are doing them more harm than we're doing them good. And we're not making the proper spiritual judgment. So now here we come. Here it is, verse 12. What business is it of mine to judge those outside the church? That's not mine. They're lost. What they need is the gospel. But are you not to judge those inside? Well, wait a minute now, Pastor. We're not supposed to judge other people. Matthew talks about that clearly. Yes, he does. We are not to judge in a state of hypocrisy. But we are to make spiritual discernments of those within the church body. We are to look out for one another. We are to pray for one another. We have the ability by the Holy Spirit to discern when one another, we may get out of line and get involved in sin And we've got to love one another to bring us back to right relationship with God. Verse 13, he said, God will judge those outside, expel the wicked man from among you. Now, that's hard work. You've got to go over to Galatians chapter 6, read the first three verses there. If you're going to be involved in this work, God calls you to this work, an Ananias kind of work, right? You've got to be willing to make sure your heart is right. You can't go into it like a Matthew 7 approach. You've got to check your own heart. You've got to fast. You've got to pray. You've got to make sure your motive's right. You've got to make sure you're pure. At least you fall as well. That's what it says over in Galatians 6. But that doesn't mean that you dismiss ever making any proper judgments among each other. We are. We're to do that. So those who are, who are spiritual understand God's truth because why? The Spirit lives in us. And the implication of the phrase that the spiritual man makes judgment about all things, here it is. The verb, make judgments, trans, it's translated as a word that means to appraise something. Okay, take for example, I, the best way I know to maybe ex, uh, explain this is, if I'm going to make a spiritual judgment about your life, or you're going to make one about my life, which we're called to do for one another, it's like being an appraiser. You appraise the situation. You appraise the life. That's what the word means. Uh, It means to appraise something. Um, Say I know a lot about cars, which I don't know a lot about cars, but say I did know a lot about cars, and you brought some older cars that have been restored, and you get, can you tell me how much this car is worth? And if I'm a car appraiser, automotive appraiser, I would say, well, let me look at the condition of the car. Does it have any rust on it? Uh, How many miles does it have on it? Let me try to look at the interior and see what it's like. And so I've got to check various things. Let's raise the hood up and see what the engine looks like. Uh, does it, everything on this stock or has things been added? Has the engine been changed? And, and an appraiser knows how to look it over. Uh, he knows how to evaluate it and make a judgment call on what the value of the car is. Do you understand that? Now, spiritually speaking, we are to be appraisers of one another, meaning that if, if I'm in right condition, God calls me to do this, and I look at your life and I notice something's off, I am to lovingly appraise where things are off in your life. This is one of the great tragedies in the local church today is that we have brought ourselves over into a love and mercy category in the New Testament grace period. And what we say is, oh, everything can go, anything can go. and We're all loving and caring and forgiving. And we don't want to say anything harsh. And we for sure don't want to judge. And we don't want to, uh, you know, uh, don't get uncomfortable here about anything. But, but you know what we're doing? We're doing ourselves a disservice because we're unwilling to speak truth, live truth, that the Holy Spirit within us is dying to pour through us to the other person to be of value to them. 
Now, whether they receive that or reject that's going to be up to them. But aren't we called that? What kind of, let me, may I ask you a question? What kind of loving pastor would I be if I, if I skirted all sin in my preaching and never spoke of anything that I thought may be offensive to you because I don't want to upset you? Would that really be love? Would that really, I mean, come on. Would that really connect you back to God the way you should be connected? Would that really help you in any way? No. But we've gone into this era where we say, you know, you, you don't, and I agree. If someone stands up in hypocrisy and they beat you down over the head with truth, I don't think that's of God. I think it's got to come from a loving heart led by the Holy Spirit for the glory of God and the best interest of that believer to be in right relationship with God that we, we don't skirt the truth, we don't ignore the truth, but we speak, as the Bible said, the truth in love. That's what we are to do. And that's why Paul says, because we have the Holy Spirit, we can properly appraise the real value of things. What it means to appraise is to be, to give loving accountability of truth. And when that's accepted, it is an act of love, not judgment. James 5, 19 and 20 says, My brothers, if any one of you should wonder from the truth and someone should bring him back, remember this. Whoever turns a sinner from the error of his way will save him from death and cover over a multitude of sins. Every child that knows that their parent truly loves them and a parent has intervened out of love with truth for them, as they grow and mature, they always look back and say, thank you for intervening in my life with that truth that I needed at the time. I couldn't see it at the time, but thank you. Isn't that true? And isn't that what we're supposed to do for one another under the leadership of the Holy Spirit? There's a third thing in this particular verse we should note, is that is the spiritual man is not subject to man's judgment because he is subject to God. Now, is that a point of arrogance for us? No. It's not like, God's going to deal with me. I don't care what you say, whatever. Uh, he's, not, he's not trying to say that. What he's trying to say is this. The lost person, they don't get us. The lost person can't even understand us. We're accountable to God because the Holy Spirit lives within us. We're accountable to truth, that which is greater than us. And so we don't live for the praise of man or the accountability to other people. As a believer in Christ, our ultimate thing is that we are accountable to God who will judge the living and the dead. We will give an account, for the Bible says, for everything done in the body, whether good or bad. Judgment day is coming, and it will be the one who created us that we will stand before. And we know that, but the lost person doesn't get that. So we don't hold that against them, but we recognize that, listen, I don't live to please you. I have a greater accountability. It is to God and the Holy Spirit that lives within me in connection to this truth that He is giving me that I'm accountable to. And so then that just changes everything, does it not? And that's what He's saying. So this whole verse about discernment, it is the ability to see things for what they really are. You see them from God's angle, from God's point of view. And there, here we are. The first thing we said was this, that when you become a Christian, the Holy Spirit lives within you. Because the Holy Spirit lives within you, you will face rejection. And because the Holy Spirit lives within you, you will live with discernment. Now, it has to be applied correctly, but we have discernment. The ability to appraise a situation spiritually for the glory of God. And then the last thing he says to them is this, is that you live with the mind of Christ. Verse 16. For who has known the mind of the Lord that he may instruct him? You know, and you got to remember back just a few verses before this, it said that the, the Holy Spirit um, searches the deep things of God. He knows the heart of God, right? And he's the one that lives within us, right? And so this is why we have the mind of Christ. Believers understand the truth of God. We understand the ways of God because we have been given the mind of Christ. Not because we can work it up. Not because we're smart. We've been given this. And this is why this makes sense to us. This is why we understand God's ways. 
because we've been given the mind of Christ. Man, what an advantage. We've been given the Holy Spirit. Man, what an advantage that is. And the lost person can't grasp God and His ways. But we grasp this completely when we're surrendered to the Holy Spirit. You remember at the beginning I said that God gave me four verses? He did. I've shared three of those passages with you. I want to share a fourth with you. That dealt with rejection. This was the fourth one that God gave me. Um, it comes out of, you want to turn over there to 2 Timothy chapter 4. And I, this is such a meaningful text to me. In, in fact, this is one of the first sermons I ever preached was this particular text when I was a student minister in Dallas, Texas. Um, I had a chance to preach. They let me preach uh, one Sunday night. And this is the text because I had been living it, meditating on it for several years. They came to mind, and this is what I preached. And this, this will always be meaningful to me. And I want to share this with you because it's kind of a culmination of facing rejection, understanding that you understand truth by the Holy Spirit, and that we have the mind of Christ. It kind of pulls it all together. It is here in 2 Corinthians chapter 4 that it says, Paul is saying to Timothy, he said, do your best to come to me quickly for Demas, because he loved this world, has deserted me and has gone to Thessalonica. Now, I felt that. I knew some people that, came, that claimed Christ, but they deserted me. They deserted Christ, and really they were just completely living for the world. And I don't know whether they knew the Lord or not, but I know they were claiming, but they deserted. They were a Demas. He says, he's deserted me. He's gone to Thessalonica. Christians has gone to Galatia and Titus to Dalmatia. Only Luke is with me. Get Mark and bring him with you because he is helpful to me in my ministry. I sent Tychus to Ephesus. When he came, when you come, bring the cloak that I left with a carpus at Troas and my scrolls, especially the parchments. So he's giving these kind of instructions of, of what he needs and what's going on in his life. And then he, then, he, then he puts this out there. And he said, Alexander, the metal worker, this is a person that was completely lost. He did me a great deal of harm. So why, 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 what's Alexander got against him? We're going to see. He said, the Lord will repay him for what he's done. You too should be on your guard against him because he strongly opposed our message. He didn't write, he strongly opposed my hair color. He strongly opposed the robe I was wearing. He strongly opposed my horse or my donkey or my jokes. He didn't oppose any of that. Where the opposition came, point taken, it was the message. He said, at my first defense, no one came to my support, but everyone deserted me. May it not be held against them. Boy, that's free when you get to that point, right? For those who desert you that you can really say, may it not be held against them. And here's what he, he is saying. But the Lord stood at my side and gave me strength. This is the part I want you to underline. So that through me, the message might be fully proclaimed. That's it right there. That's it. That's it. And all the Gentiles might hear it. And I was delivered from the lion's mouth. The Lord will rescue me from every evil attack and bring me safely to his heavenly kingdom. To him be glory forever and ever. Amen. Let me tell you something. If we went through what Paul went through here, Demas deserting you, everybody coming against you, Alexander the metal worker calling you out publicly, none of the believers sticking with you. I mean, some of us just want to quit, right? I mean, where's your brother in Christ? Where's the one that's supposed to be standing beside you? Where's the one that's always been walking with you? Where are they now? Why have they left? Where have they gone? What's going on? And what Paul said is this, listen, I, I'm not going to hold that against them. I, I've forgiven them. The Lord will take care of that. But here's what I do know, that the Lord gave me strength. He didn't desert me. He stayed with me. And guess what he allowed me to do? He allowed me to preach the gospel message so it may be heard. If there's one thing the enemy wants to do to the church today, he wants to get us sidetracked on everything else but the gospel message. Everything else. Anything else. Whatever else. But it is the only message we have. It is the one that has been given to us. And if we stray from that, 
Can we even call ourselves a church of Jesus Christ? I would argue we cannot because we've been given a commission, we've been given a mission, and we've got to speak the message. See, my prayer for our church is that we grasp that church is about the gospel message foundationally, not just what we perceive to be relevant to our lives in whatever stage of life we're in. We live in a day and time where Christians... Uh, they're driven by, driven by their immediate need as priority over gospel. It's a very dangerous thing. And we've, we've helped this along in, in many ways. We've said, come to church, it's about you. It's not. It's not our church, it's not about us, and it's not our message. It is the message of Christ that saved us, and it is by His grace and His mercy so that you get to be an ambassador and you get to share this message. And if we're in step with the Holy Spirit that lives within us and He's revealing truth to us, I know that that is the thing that is going to ground us and the thing that is going to compel us to do the will of God that the message of Jesus Christ crucified has to be the driving force. But we live in a culture where people say, well, church isn't doing anything for me. They're not meeting my needs. The first question we ought to ask of every church is, is Christ crucified the foundational message that drives the existence of the church? Number one. For if it does not, we're missing it. We all have needs. I, I, I get that. But needs must not drive what church is to the point that the gospel as priority takes a back seat. I'm going to give you seven concluding thoughts about these three verses that we should draw conclusions about. Number one is this, is that people without the Holy Spirit will always consider the message of the cross as foolishness. It cannot, will not make sense to them. My second conclusion is this, is that God reveals truth to those who are like little children when we are dependent, when we come weak, for those who are ignored, for those who are overlooked in the world. You know, really, I mean, think about it. He comes to those who are broken, and oftentimes the world doesn't value them. He does this because pride manifests in resources and reasoning has to be rejected by a holy God. For He is the only one that has the answer. We do not, cannot. The third conclusion is this. The world's only hope is to preach Christ crucified. The one message they can understand is conviction of sin which leads to conversion and salvation. We must not be surprised when the message of Christ crucified is rejected and it becomes a stumbling block. The Bible says that that message for some is the fragrance of death, to the others it is a perfume of life. It's both. But yet we still preach it. Fifthly, we must be humbled and grateful that the Holy Spirit revealed to us our need for salvation. Don't ever lose that. And continues to reveal truth we need to live life. We know truth for living life because the Holy Spirit reveals it. It's not that you and I deserve it. We don't. We don't, we don't deserve it. it. It is by God's grace and His mercy He reveals it to us. Number six, we will not know God if we're not born again and live in a state of brokenness. There's going to be a lot of people, especially up to the end times before Christ returns, that are going to claim they know God, going to claim they serve God. In fact, it says in Matthew that some of those are going to stand before God and claim and say, look at all the things we've done. He's going to say, away from me, I never knew you. There's going to be a lot of that going on right up to the end. But unless you're born again, and you live in a state of dependence, the Holy Spirit's in control, we will not know God. We may know religion, but we're not going to know God. 
The seventh and final thing I would say to you is this. We must be faithful to preach Christ crucified until he returns. It is our mission. It is the only thing. It is the only thing that will make a difference. Satan knows it and he fights against it. But we will prevail as the church. You say, how do you know? Because Jesus said we will. Because he builds the church. We are his bride. And if we'll do it his way, I have full confidence that we can stand before him with a clear conscience and hear him say, well done, my good and faithful servant. Michelle and I were sitting in the den the other night. And we were talking about a trip we want to take in a year. Just plan it out, go to some national parks, some different things, places we'd like to go. And she she laid out this long trip and all this, where we were going to go and what we were going to do. And she was telling me all about it. And I said, yeah, that sounds great. Hey, you know, I, like, I said, I'd like to go here. And I named the place. She said, but that's not on our route. I said, I know, it's probably not that far off. She goes, let me check. So you know how on Google, you can just take the map and you just move it over, and then it tells you you add a trip and how much time it is and that kind of thing. So I'd listed off a couple of them. And I said, let's go here. And so she looked it up and pulled it over. That adds two more hours, Mark. That adds four more hours, Mark. If we go over here, then we're way over here. And so we, we just kind of bat, you know, batted that back and forth, talked about that, and then the trip would be that long, and then, you know, all this. And finally, came to the conclusion, said, let's just leave it on the, on the route we said, right? I said, okay. But I'll tell you a little story because that's how we are. We go, well, I just want to get off, get off track for a little bit. Let's just go over here and try this for a little while. And that's only an hour or two out of the way. Then we go over here and we go, well, you know, hey, they're offering something over here. Let me go try that over there. And before you know it, you're on a path far from the path where the gospel is the foundation and the driving force behind everything we do for the glory of God. And oftentimes those things aren't bad things, they're good things. But when they replace, when they supersede the gospel and they drive the life, and we're no longer preaching the gospel, Christ crucified, we're no longer, and isn't that what Paul said? He said, while I was with you, the only thing I knew was Christ crucified. <laughs> he stayed the course. And if we don't stay the course and make disciples that way, one day we're going to say, hey God, I went over here and here's all the things I did and I thought this was better for me because it met my needs. He's going to say, you didn't stay on the course. You, you, you didn't stay the course. Well, but, but that, but, no, no. The course is Christ crucified. Yeah, but some people were rejecting me. It didn't feel good. It felt better over here. Well, of course it did. Satan knows that. Yeah, I used to pass out uh, uh, Bibles all the time. I just saw Jim up there. Made me think about it. He's Gideon. He passes out Bibles all the time. Yeah, but I, and he'll tell me stories. I passed out one guy didn't want it. Another guy wanted it. And the last three guys didn't want it. And maybe this guy wants it. And, and then, you know, but God's called me to do that. Jim gets over here and he goes, well, you know, I'm just not going to pass out Bibles anymore. It just, the culture doesn't want them anymore. I've been rejected too many times. God's going to say, Jim, I put it on your heart. I called you to do that, just to pass out Bibles. That's all. But I was doing good things over here. Really? Yeah, they might have been good, but are they the foundational driving force of Christ crucified? That's all I'm asking. That's all I'm asking for us to think about as a church. Because I believe with all my heart, if we are broken, surrendered to the Holy Spirit that lives within us, yes, we're going to face... We're going to face rejection. But yes, we have discernment to determine what is right. And yes, we have the mind of Christ. And in so doing, I believe that in that surrendered state, it will be, as Paul said in the verses above this, it was Christ crucified always as the driving force. Because that's what it's all about. That's what makes a difference for the glory of God. Let's go to the Lord in prayer.